Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today we're in London at the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer, proceeded with Dr. Michael Tuttle from Sloan McKettery, Dr. Akira Miyaguchi from Kuma Hospital in Kobe, Japan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Miyuchi. Thanks very much. This is exciting. It's always fun to be here with Professor Miyuchi, who taught me how to do all this years ago. So it's uh, fun to be able to sort of pick his brain a little bit more and see how he's thinking about things now. And it's progressed. We're talking about active surveillance, and even the name active surveillance has changed a little bit or evolved. But it's been going on for more than 30 years now and started at Puma Hospital. Not more than 30, but actually 30 years ago. <laughs> 1993, I proposed uh, the trial of active surveillance at Kuma Hostel. It was uh, approved and the trial started in the same year. So this is the 30, exactly 30th year of the trial. And, and on past interviews, if those watching or listening on iTunes, they've heard your interviews before on active yeah. surveillance. And they're quite popular for your interviews. <laughs> so it's really special to have both of you seated together uh, for one interview. What have we learned? What, what new findings are most, would you say, most awe, provide most, most awe moments right now? Well, the most important thing is the safety of active surveillance. On, uh, I mean, the oncological outcome. I mean, the uh, disease progression or appearance of the lymph node metastasis or death from thyroid cancer. Actually, death from thyroid cancer. There is no case of death of uh, thyroid cancer. So, the most important thing might be the oncologic safety of the active surveillance. One. The second might be uh, compared to the uh, immediate surgery. The incidence of unfavorable events such as vocal cord paralysis or hypoparathyroidism or patient with surgical scar, uh, patients taking the levothyroxine, uh, these incidences are significantly uh, smaller in active surveillance compared to the immediate surgery. Yeah. I think one thing for patients who are hearing this for the first time, mm -hmm. I think it's important that they hear again that you just said during active surveillance there has not been a single case of death, which means, for those listening, that people will have cancer. Well, there was death uh, during active surveillance because of other diseases, other causes, but nobody so far died of thyroid cancer. Yeah, I think that's the real key. And uh, Kira just published in the last week or two 30 years of his experience, the longest experience in the world that we're all still reading and, and trying to digest. But I think the real key when I talk to patients is what happens if they are one of those that grows a little bit while we're watching? Um, and the message uh, is that we can treat that just as well, that if we would have treated you yesterday. If we watch and things change a little bit, or if we watch and there's a small spread to a lymph node, our therapies are gonna be just as effective then as they are now. So we don't want them worried and scared to death what happens if something changes. No, the whole concept of active surveillance, not only in thyroid cancer, but in prostate and CLL and other leukemias and a variety of things, is that early intervention is not critical. If you need to do a delayed intervention or a treatment down the road, the outcomes are going to be the same, survival is going to be the same, the, the surgery is not going to be riskier, you're not going to be exposed to more aggressive things. So the idea is that these are changing so slowly and the patterns that Kuma Hospital set up to watch them allows us to find those changes early enough that we can treat at any point we need to down the road. Yeah, yeah during the, our active surveillance trial, uh, about 5% of the patients showed small increases in size, actually uh, 3 millimeter or more uh, size increase. The incidence was uh, only 5% at 10 years uh, active surveillance, and appearance of small lymph node in the neck was uh, 1% at 10 year uh, active surveillance period. And the more important thing is uh, 
these patients had uh, conversion surgery, uh, underwent surgery, and after that, there's no recurrence, no distant metastasis. So we think active surveillance is a very good uh, initial management of the small papillary thyroid cancer. And with active surveillance, we can uh, efficiently select uh, bad small cancer that might show any progression. So for these small minority of the patients, we can do surgery. And uh, it is not too late to do uh, surgery for that kind of patient. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, and I, I went, when I first started this, where we started about 12 years or so ago uh, with Professor Mianzi's help, um, I worried what happened when those people had to go to surgery. Um, he had convinced me it would be safe, but I didn't know what the patient experience would be like. Would they be mad? Would they be upset? Should I have done it? And I can tell you, every one of mine, we're the same 5% um, that needed change. Every one of them said, thank you for helping my keep my thyroid for two years or for five years or seven years. Or I'm glad I waited because now that I have a lymph node metastasis, maybe the surgery is a little bit different. We get one surgery instead of two. So having seen a few now that are on the other side of that, I can tell you for most people, they weren't upset. They were sad that we had to do something, but they felt like they'd given it their best. Um, and the other thing, at least in the United States, um, the, most of the patients that I'm watching um, haven't rejected treatments. They've rejected my treatment. They treat themselves. Um, they take every herb I've never heard of. They do something called exercise I'm not familiar with. They, they do a variety of things. And that's important because when they come back to see you, I used to say, good news, everything is stable. And they would look disappointed. Mm -hmm. They didn't want it to be stable. They wanted it to shrink. Uh, so this idea that they're rejecting treatment, no, they're just rejecting our upfront treatment, and we're fine with that because we don't think they need it. So it's been fun to see how everybody's been sort of treating themselves and self-help um, and as part of the very engaged in the process. So they get thyroid cancer, which initially they're thinking, oh no, I have cancer. Then they're being told you can have active surveillance. Then they go home and start doing things to make their lifestyle more healthy. And now they get cancer, they don't have to get surgery, and in fact they're feeling better mm -hmm. because they've made life, they've had one of these moments in life where they say, okay, mm -hmm. I want to do everything I can. Yeah. Does diet, does exercise, do you think, affect <laughs> what I happens during that facility? I don't think uh, exercise or diet affect the, the, the outcome, but, uh, well, if patients has a one disease, man, one problem, patient might be become very uh, cautious and uh, careful uh, in, in their lifestyle. That might uh, affect better, uh, uh, how to say, better life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, better quality. Yeah. Better quality of life. Yeah. yeah, I routinely tell these patients, I don't know. Um, I also tell my own patients they're the worst research patients on the planet because if they wanted me to know if diet would work, they would do diet for a year and then we would do something else for six months, we'd do something else for six months. They don't. They do 25 things at one time. Mm -hmm. So it makes it really hard for us to know. My bias is most of the time, whatever the pace these cancers grow, that's the pace they grow. It's almost like they're on cruise control or autopilot. So there's a large intrinsic property of the tumor that hardly ever changes. But then whether they can modify that with diet and exercise, the immune system, I'm open to that. Um, they're all convincing me, especially the ones five or six percent shrink while we're watching. Oh, yes. um, and they always take the credit for them shrinking. I used to take the credit because I told them, if you come in and let me feel your <laughs> neck, it'll shrink. And then during the pandemic, I could always see them on video and it kept shrinking. So I can no longer lie and tell them it was my hand. So. We gotta, we gotta come back to the shrinking part. Well, actually, uh, during active surveillance, we found that 17% uh, 17 of the papillary cancer actually uh, clearly 
decrease in their tumor size. 17%. 17%. In his longer study, 5% in my shorter study. Mm -hmm. So the real number is the longer study. Do any other cancers do that other than well, cancer? So we reviewed uh, the cytology. Uh, uh, when at the, at the diagnosis, we, we, we routinely do, do ultrasound examination and finally the special cytology. And I reviewed uh, the ultrasound, uh, I mean the uh, cytology report, uh, picture. Uh, that is truly papillary cell cancer, but still it shrinks over time. Not all, but 17% is a good number. But I, I think uh, shrinking, uh, is, I do not, uh, I say, expecting too much. <laughs> stable, stable disease is fine. Yeah. yeah, but if you think about it, we have almost as many shrinking as growing. I mean, people don't really think about it that way, but when I say what's gonna happen over the next 10 or 20 years, some of the shrinkage, I think, is probably because we kill some of these small thyroid cancers with the biopsy. Mm -hmm. You know, these are relatively <laughs> small, and, and we're hitting the needle into them two or three times, and they can auto inflate. Um, although some of them, I wonder about the immune system and how they're doing. Um, we also know benign nodules shrink in the thyroid, no, no, like 25% yeah. of the time, mm -hmm. and we don't understand that either. So I don't know whether this is a phenomenon unique to thyroid and thyroid nodules, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, those are observations we don't really think about very much until you start seeing a lot of these patients and seeing them get smaller. Uh, we've tried to look at the molecular biology of which ones are getting smaller, we can't tell. Um, so we haven't been able to predict which ones are doing that yet. Um, but you know, if we could find some mechanism, there's a potential insight into treating cancer, right? If you know what it was about those tumors that made them different and made them shrink. Uh, but sort of a, a very interesting unknown box right now, but very real. Have you ever presented to a patient saying that they qualify for active surveillance or they're a good candidate and have them refuse active surveillance and insist on surgery? Oh, yes. Yes, there are some. Uh, but uh, in that case, we, we perform, uh, we pro uh, provide surgery. Uh, but, uh, well, especially, how to say, worrisome patient wants to undergo operation. But, uh, well, talking about the uh, quality of life, uh, there are two features. One is quality, uh, physical issues, and the one is the uh, psychological or emotional issue. On the physical issue, many researchers compare the active surveillance patient and the uh, patient who underwent immediate surgery. On physical issues, almost all report says, uh, reported uh, that the uh, uh, active surveillance patient is better than the uh, immediate surgery patient. I mean, in the physical quality of life. On the uh, emotional issue, uh, physicians who argue against active surveillance sometimes uh, say patients should be worried about can their cancer not treated. And uh, but. Uh, our data showed that the uh, patient on active surveillance had better uh, psychological quality of life compared to immediate surgery. But that is uh, uh, not prospective randomized trial. That uh, one arm is a patient who chose active surveillance, the other is patient who chose immediate surgery. Uh, patients who are basically worrisome character might have chosen mm -hmm. surgery. So our data showed uh, active surveillance patient had better uh, emotional uh, condition compared to the immediate surgery patient. Mm -hmm. But that might be a selection bias. I'm not, I'm not sure, but, but anyway, uh, 
when I visited the Michael Tuttle, Professor Michael Tuttle's uh, clinic, I was strongly impressed. Uh, he was always uh, smiling. He was always smiling when he see uh, his patient. And uh, not only the easy cases, but uh, even a uh, patient who is should seeing a patient with a primary metastasis or something, but still he was keeping smiling. Probably patient, his patient uh, will be feel relieved seeing uh, Michael Tabo. And I think uh, that, uh, that is a very nice practice. Mm -hmm. and so I try to mimic <laughs> <laughs> uh, his clinical uh, practice. Well, Light hearted, warm hearted. Yes, yeah. warm hearted. We're going to be okay. Yes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It, speaking about the uh, quality of life, on especially psychological issue, there is no way uh, measuring the way, the, I mean the physical side, physical side, uh, uh, the attitude, there is no report yeah. uh, evaluating the, I can make uh, uh, my patient make nervous, cancer worry. If you do not do operation, cancer might go, mm -hmm. metastasize, cancer might kill you. Mm -hmm. You need operation. It's very easy. There many many doctors uh, might be doing something like that. So the patients uh, uh, might become very nervous, anxious. But uh, his patient is very uh, how to say it. <laughs> uh, calm. You don't yeah, scare but, them. The, the, you're you're not giving them fear. You're approaching them uh, the way you communicate with them. Right. So it's the same as I would with anybody I was having dinner with. If it's a, it's a communication style, yeah. Um, and and I think you know where I'll I'll often start these consultations because like by the time they see us, they've seen two or three different people, and one surgeon has said you have to have surgery, and the other endocrinologist said, well, you're crazy if you have surgery. How can you have that? So I will often start the consultations by I think there's two right answers. One right answer is surgery, one right answer is active surveillance. Let's talk about both mm -hmm. and let's find the right answer for you. For some people, they can never think about watching the smallest spot of thyroid cancer and they're better served with a minimalistic surgery and really good hands. And then there are other people that can't imagine why we're rushing to surgery and they're better served. And what Akira's study showed is if you help people make that decision, and they do, uh, with handouts and paper and information and phenomenal nurses that's helping them. Once they make the right decision, they are very comfortable with that decision. If they made the decision for surgery, even if they had a complication, they are glad they had surgery. If they made the decision to watch, and even if things changed, they were glad they made that decision. So working on how you provide that right balance. Um, and I think part of the focus that I've had is reminding doctors just that we have a bias. Um, I'm very minimalistic, which makes me unusual for an endocrinologist, right? Um, surgeons often are more maximalistic because that's kind of the way they are. And you just have to know that you bring that to the table. So that can be a criticism of me because I tend to like less aggressive things. Um, maybe right or wrong, but I need to know that when I'm talking to you as an individual person. Because people often ask me, well, if I were you, what would you do? And I said, well, you gotta understand about me first. You know, I use my voice for a living, I lecture for a living, I've seen thousands of patients, I'm gonna be laid back. My wife would probably want surgery yesterday or she'd go to Kuma and get a second opinion. Um, so we just we have different ways that we, that we address that medical thing. And I think both of our centers do a good job with, you know, we take the credit because we're the face of this. But the reality is it's our nurses, it's our personnel that puts them in the room, it's our fellows that start that conversation with us so that they're comfortable knowing we're not gonna let them make a wrong decision. If it's wrong, we'll tell you we think it's wrong. But if it's right, you know, there are shades of gray that we can help you with. I think it's interesting, interesting because with both of you, there's patients listening right now who are watching and they're being told the fear approach by their doctor, uh, you need a surgery. And I think what's important, especially when you're listening to this, how thorough 
you are walking through and saying, listen, there are psychological, emotional, physical effects of removing your thyroid. Uh, it's not just taking a pill. Uh, let's really wait a moment and talk through this yeah. and make sure it's something you need or want to do. Yeah, and there's lots of folks now putting together decision aids and websites to help you sort of think through what are the pros and cons of both approaches and what is your value system. I mean, I've got a bunch of people that want surgery, but they don't want it now. Um, they're, you know, actors and actresses and police officers and people that are going to retire in four or five years. So some of them are using my watching program as a bridge to a better time. It's nice to take that pressure off for some wedding ceremony or something like that. Well, well, yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, Philip, uh, I'm a surgeon, in grand surgeon, thyroid surgeon. And uh, if big surgery gives the uh, best result, I do big surgery. It's, for example, resection of the trachea or something. Uh, I do not hesitate to do the big surgery. If uh, medium surgery gives the best surgery, I do medium surgery. If small surgery gives best outcome, I do small surgery. And uh, if no surgery gives best outcome, I do not do uh, operation. Now that's uh, very simple. For me, the outcome is the final result is the best. So I thought small papillary thyroid cancer doing uh, operation for all patients is, I, I, I felt it's too much, doing too much. And during the 30 year period, uh, I became much more confident that we can do, we can select uh, patients who uh, truly need operation. That, I mean, the, that is a minority of pyramidal cancer which increases in size during active surveillance or that shows a lymph node metastasis. We can select uh, patients. For these patients, of course, we do operation. And I, I leverage this a lot because many of the patients that I see for active surveillance come from a surgeon. So they've come from a surgeon that says, I'm not sure you need a surgery. When they come see me, I say, you saw a surgeon. Why didn't they do surgery? Surgeons do surgery. And then they go, yeah, if my surgeon didn't think I needed a surgery. I mean, how, how powerful a message is that? So I often start, that's always part of my consultation if they've seen a surgeon before. And I usually tease them that, why is the surgeon not operating? They should be operating. Were they too busy? What was going on? And, then, and they'll explain to me, no, they just didn't think it was necessary. They thought the surgery might hurt me more than it helped me. And it opens that door into saying, well, I think they may be right. These are some of the best surgeons on the planet referring to me. And let's explore what other options that we would have. Communication is so key. You mentioned something, Dr. Terrell, about when you were telling some patients, no worry, you can come back in five, four years, three years uh, and have the surgery. What is that conversation like? Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, the, to be honest with you, most people, when you talk to them, know within 30 minutes if they want surgery or they want to watch. They've made decisions their entire life, medical decisions, and they, they know which camp they fall in. Um, and then I've got a few that can't figure out if they're more afraid of cancer or if they're more afraid of the surgery. That's a difficult place to be, right? You're afraid of both options. So I routinely encourage those guys to just think about it come back and see me in six months or three months with an ultrasound, we're not in any hurry. You get another ultrasound that I call my I told you so ultrasound, nothing changed, no big deal. Um, surgery, I can't back that up. So it's very seldom in thyroid cancer. Certainly, if you're a good candidate for watching, there is no hurry to make this decision. You don't make it at the end of the visit with me. If you need to think about it, talk to me again in three months. Some people like to do another ultrasound in three months or six months, and I say, fine, there's no problem with that. And then we'll take that much more information. Now we know it hasn't changed in six months, and we kind of go from there. So I do encourage people not to make a decision two seconds into the thinking about this. Um, and having that follow-up conversation with a lot of people is really important. Let's review the past 20, 30 years and how the response 
to active surveillance has changed at events like this one, the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. Because the reason I ask, I've recorded over 100 interviews on the Dr. Thyroid podcast with the top thyroid doctors around the world, including the two of you. And it's some surgeons, even during those podcasts, maybe two or three have said, if we see any kind of cancer, we want to do surgery. I'm a proponent. Uh, it's one reason you've been on podcasts often to active surveillance because surgery doesn't always go well. Um, what is the response this year at the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer compared to say even 10 years ago or 12 years ago? Yeah, I'll, I'll do this one because he's too, he's too you, you, he won't say this the real truth. So I watched for uh, probably 15 or 20 years as he was trying to tell us that we could watch these small tumors. And I heard that only works in Japan, it only works in the Japanese, it only works in one hospital. Um, maybe they're not really giving people consent. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and I think his 15 or 20 years worth of work that then coincided with all of the small thyroid cancers we were finding in the United States, we had no choice but to go back and look at that. This was so paradigm shifting that the concept that you wouldn't do a surgery in all of oncology, but certainly in thyroid cancer. But when we were faced with that, we're diagnosing all these small stuff. That's what really opened the door that says, holy cow, we really need to look at this data. Because he was right in 1993. There were people that were hurting more than were helping. And it was 20 years, I think, of him banging his head against the wall, trying to convince people this was a good thing that to my mind sort of crossed over that minimal disease we found that made everybody kind of open up the door. Um, still wasn't very well accepted, um, still was difficult. I mean, he and I, him more than me, some meetings were, you know, you weren't, didn't feel very welcome and people thought you were crazy. And, but I think now we're past that. We're now into what I call the implementation phase where many centers all over the world, not just ours, are now watching and they're trying to figure out who's the right person to watch, mm -hmm. how do I do that, mm -hmm. um, how do I discuss this with a patient, how do I present this, how do I do follow-up. So I suspect what we'll hear most over the next few days is questions about who and how. Mm -hmm. How are you guys doing that? How? Because clearly we're doing it successfully, but how do you implement that in other countries and that sort of stuff. So I think we're over the hump where intellectually people accept this is the right idea. Um, and into sort of that, who are the right patients, how do we do it, how do we mimic this experience no matter where else we do it in the world. It's been a process. It's now where active surveillance is more accepted. And some of the resistors, you actually have their ear now, uh, more so today than you had maybe 12 years ago. Yeah. But to be fair, there are still people uh, the same surgeon that would tell the patient to have surgery, if it was in her thyroid, she would have surgery. So that you know, we're, that's part of our job. We, we, I would, I want to treat people like I would treat my family, and so that's part of us understanding our aggressiveness, projecting on other people that that's an option. So it took me about, it probably was about five or six years ago when I realized I wasn't going to convince everybody that this was the right thing, that I just had to get them to accept that this was an option even if they wouldn't personally do it. So I think we're at that point now. So I don't expect everybody in the whole world to agree that this is a great thing to do. Um, but I just need them to accept that we're not wrong. And I need to accept that this is not ethical. I need to accept that this is a viable treatment option for the right patients. And if as a surgeon or an endocrinologist you don't feel comfortable watching somebody, that's fine. Send them to somebody who might do that. Um, I'm not bound to do every medical procedure in the world if I'm not comfortable with it, but I do need to let people know that that option is available at other places. So I'm not going to try to convince everybody to start an active surveillance program, but to be aware for the right type of people they should refer. The same way we do for clinical trials and distant metastasis. I spent my life as a referral thing just on the exact opposite end. And I think that's where we are now um, and building small, now more university-sized regional places where active surveillance is no longer just two or three big centers, it's lots of places to some degree. For those watching or listening, and they've been diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer, if you could tell them one thing, what would you tell them? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, to be honest with you, that's a really hard question because it's hard to answer that without minimizing their experience. 
Um, you get diagnosed with thyroid cancer, you got a cancer. Um, no question about it. That's the label we put on people. Um, but the vast majority of thyroid cancer, incredibly treatable. Doesn't even necessarily need to be treated right now, many of the times. Um, when I was younger, I used to tell people, don't worry, you'll be at my retirement party. But now people don't find that as reassuring. Apparently I look too old now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so the message is very, very treatable. Um, and the message is generally we're not going to get in a big hurry here. We're going to have some options, we're going to have some decisions that we're, you're often going to be faced with two right answers. There's not always going to be a one right answer here. So you're going to have to sort of think through with me uh, with those issues. So I mean, I think that's to my, that'd be my sort of take home. Dr. Tutter, we're going to need an arena, arena <laughs> for your retirement party. <laughs> for all those you've helped either directly or indirectly, because there's a lot of people that listen to these podcasts and you've helped them. Uh, same with Dr. Miucci, save them from unnecessary surgery. Mm -hmm. So your retirement, prop, uh, retirement party is going to be quite a celebration. Well, if you want to follow up on that, the, which anniversary did we come celebrate? The Kuma anniversary was the... 90th. 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 Okay. Yeah, in the last year we uh -huh. had the 90th anniversary uh -huh. of Kuma Hospital. And uh, uh, Professor Michael Tato came to Kuma Hospital to give special lecture at the ceremonial event. And it was an amazing experience to be able to see them honoring him for all of his work. Uh, and to get to go to a relatively small hospital in a relatively small city in Japan and tell them how their work had changed the world. Changed thousands and thousands and thousands of people that now have the option mm -hmm. of doing that. I mean, you seldom get that in your career. And to be able to, for my wife and I to celebrate that with he and his wife, um, and let that hospital and community and all the people there that work there know that this wasn't just some crazy idea. This is something that changed dramatically how we do things over time. Um, there are very few people that have that kind of experience in their career. And I think it took 20 years of uh, pushing a rock up a hill to, to get us to the place where we had enough background information that we could then move that forward. Well, uh, speaking about the, the uh, acceptance of our idea, yeah. uh, uh, actually Professor Michael Tuttle had a very big influence. Uh, he is a very uh, strong influential person and he uh, actually expanded uh, how to spread our idea to it's the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to another part of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very lucky because uh, he was there. It's a good team. Yeah. Yeah, I got, to, team. I got to come visit uh, right at the time where this idea was coming. Mm -hmm. was there for another reason, but got to see the center and he showed me ultrasound after ultrasound after ultrasound of patients sitting in front of his computer. And when I went back to Memorial, I said, this is real. I just saw, I don't, we must look at 20 or 30 different patients where it was just exactly the same. And that sort of was the genesis of us doing that. Plus, it also shows the benefits of collaboration. Because as soon as we decided to do this, I emailed him and said, all right, I don't know exactly how you're doing this, but I got to understand so that I can figure out how to do it on my side. So there were lots of emails and phone calls and drinks all over the planet as he was sort of explaining to me how they did things at Kuma and how I could bring that into a U.S. context and what that would look like. And the fun part was the more of this I learned, the more of this was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It was using exactly the same techniques, it just translated over. It wasn't, I thought it'd be something different from culture. It turned out not to be. People are people and information is information and options are options and presenting them. Um, so it's been amazing to see how parallel, even as the two of us have grown over this last 10 years, I'd write him and I'd say, I'm thinking about doing this, and he'd go, yeah, I know, we're writing the paper right now. It, it works, you're on the right path, so. Well, listen, thank both of you for doing this and saving so many patients from unnecessary surgeries, preserving their quality of life, avoiding a thyroidectomy, uh, when they've been told opposite. So this is a thank you from all the patients you've helped. Um, any final words before we say farewell, Dr. Miyuchi? Well, I think uh, I have told all, almost everything, and uh, yeah, but uh, when I started the active surveillance trial uh, 30 years ago, I was worried about the, the um, 
uh, about the, the including the elderly patients with uh, popular micro cancer because they, we, I knew <laughs> that the elderly patient with the clinical large popular, micro, popular cancer had a poor prognosis. So I worried, but uh, when uh, after the active surveillance trial, we learned that younger patient, I mean the patient younger than uh, 40 years, is much more likely to show small progression, mm -hmm. not very much, but the small progression compared to the older patients. The actually patient older than 60 years uh, minimal uh, uh, progression group. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so I I I learned uh, many things from uh, our uh, uh, study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I do not know why, but uh, that. Uh, uh, I think that is true thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, by some reason, patients be between 20 to 40 years are more likely to show uh, tumor enlargement and the appearance of mm -hmm. metastasis. But we know the, these patients are very good after uh, surgery. The prognosis is very good. So I don't worry too much. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I, I think I learned patience. Um, uh, I tend to want things to happen quickly and I want to change things quickly. And then working with Akira, how long it took him to make this big major change made me sort of slow down. I think I'm, I'm thinking more in US terms where we think in like 100 years is a long time. He thinks more in Japanese terms where like 5,000 years is a long time. So I, I think helping me understand the patience and going through that. Um, Understanding that when you're right, don't give up. When you're right, you're right. Um, just keep publishing data, publishing information, um, and eventually the data wins out. Um, so that's helped me in the uh, other parts of my career and other things that I was doing as well. Um, and then lastly, find really good collaborators. I mean, who would have thought you know New York and Kobe, and Kobe would be partners in crime? Yeah. Um, it you know. Reaching out, finding good mentors, um, and you know, helping each other, and being honest with each other, and making sure that we're pushing in the right direction. I think it's been a phenomenal journey for us. I mean, for me personally, um, and that, you know, you learn a lot that you can apply not only in this particular aspect of our thyroid cancer, but other aspects and life as a dad and a granddad and husband and all that sort of stuff as well. So it's been a been a fun journey. Although he pointed out to me, I have this wonderful picture of him outside. What was the castle? The castle, uh, the castle. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, he did this wonderful warrior pose, where it looks like he was still fighting. So he promised me that even though he was retiring, he was still fighting the battle. So he's still in that with me. So. Great. Uh, well, thank, thank you. Both. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Oh.